Well, I have uh, three o'clock. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, looks like the record button is on here. So uh, Mr. Robert Pritz is our, our regional program leader in San Angelo. He's the man behind the curtain running the Zoom here. Um, so thank you, Robert, for doing that. Um, I don't know if Lori is on or not, but uh, Jake and I have been in, in communication uh, with Lori Slella about doing some educational workshops for, for a while now, and an opportunity presented itself. Uh, we're doing some research, and we've done a, a similar type of a program for another breed association talking about technologies and things that we're developing, and so we kind of had the idea to host this little webinar and um, provide some uh, up-to-date information to the, the Dorfer breeders about next generation sheep breeding technology that we're doing research and education around. My name is Reed Redden. I'm a sheep and goat specialist for Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Uh, we are based in San Angelo, Texas. Jake Thorne is on with me. His uh, title is not on the slide, but uh, Jake and his, his extension associate uh, that works for me and he's working on his PhD uh, doing sheep genetics research. And so um, I'm going to give a little bit of a background. Jake's going to jump in and I'll kind of come back in and, and finish some things up throughout here. Uh, before we get too far down the road, I wanted to provide some information so that if you wanted to contact us at a later date, it's all right here. Um, that's the telephone number to the office. Um, you can call and, and leave a voicemail. You should go to my, my voice recording there and grab my cell phone number if you need that. My email's on there. Uh, we're very active on Facebook, so at Tammy Sheep and Goats. Uh, we generally have a post almost every day. Uh, we like to do a lot of Facebook Live videos, so if you've seen those, let us know what you think of them. If you're not, uh, follow us on our page and, and check those out. Uh, we do have a Twitter page, uh, not a huge following. We're growing our Instagram. And then there's also a website where you can stay up to date on some of the things that we're doing, uh, where I post a monthly blog. And that blog's called Reads Ramblings. And Jake is a, a guest author for that from time to time. So uh, we'll see if this is going to work here. All right. So when we think about um, next generation sheep breeding, uh, we want to kind of look at where we've been and where we're going. Um, I'm, I'm pretty involved with the American Sheep Industry Association, and, and I put this up there just because I really like their tagline or their, their motto from this last year's convention, which is reverence for the past, uh, innovation for the future. And so that's going to kind of be the way we structure this, this webinar today. Um, just before we get too far, a little housekeeping, I think everybody's going to be on mute and your, your video's turned off. Uh, we were expecting a fairly large number of people to join us today, and, and, and we get a, a fair amount of background noise, but we'll turn those back on when we get to the end, and we'll do some little Q&A. So as we think about reverence for the past, um, you know, visual grading has been a means of genetic selection uh, since sheep were domesticated um, in reality. And so we visually look at the animals and, and identify the traits that we like and select against the traits that we don't. Um, this is a technology that we still use today. It's very important in what we're doing. Um, there's some advantages to it. It's, it's very cheap. Uh, you know, most people have pretty good vision at an early age. We may have to invest in some glasses um, as we get older. I know I'm having a little bit trouble uh, reading things up close, but uh, so it's fairly cheap to be able to look and visually assess animals. And it just takes time to learn what things we're looking for and things that we're selecting against. Um, it's a pretty simple predictor of things like the body size of an animal, especially when they hit a mature age. Um, the structural integrity of the animals, make sure they're square on their feet and they don't have any structural problems. Uh, for the most part, we can see the degree of muscling, uh, especially in the more important regions of the animals where we have high, va high value cuts like the rack and the loin and the leg. Um, and we can also see some other attributes or defects like undershot jaw or, you know, entropy in eyes or you know, with dorpers and maybe too little wool or not enough wool, depending on what your selection strategies are for, or color. Uh, color is very important to uh, market your breed so that the animals look uh, and have the color that, that is consistent with that breed. The negative for visual grading is we can't really select for things that we can't see. We can't see very easily and predict. 
um, those certain traits, you know, the top level ones are reproduction and fertility. Um, we really have a hard time estimating that visually. We can do things like look at their scrotal size, look at the femininity of an animal, but those aren't very good predictors for things that we can measure. And we can measure how many lambs they have. Um, the trouble is measuring that lifetime production of, of a ewe. And then often in a ram, um, you know, the ram has got part genetics from his mother and part genetics from his father. And his father um, is the one that is responsible for fertility, but has almost nothing to do with whether that lamb was a single or a twin or how it was raised. And so reproduction is, is really a non-visual trait. Uh, parasite resistance is a tough one to see. Uh, we can definitely do some FAMACHA scoring and see when animals are showing clinical signs and symptoms of parasitism. Uh, but there's lots of times that they carry a very high parasite load and not show symptoms, and we don't know the degree of the whole group as being exposed to parasites. And then there's also animals that, that have carrier traits, some antagonistic traits, um, you know, things like your skin diseases and different things where it's a carrier and you couldn't see it in them, but it's still going to pass those on to its offspring. And then there's some antagonistic traits, things like size and muscling. Uh, we know with good, good science now that we keep selecting for bigger and bigger animals. Often it comes at a cost to something else like, um, you know, how easy they keep and good condition they stay in within a, in a limited environment and, and negative against reproduction. And so it's hard to, to, to balance all those things with just visual. Um, along with those uh, things towards visual is, is we've kind of expanded that visual into exhibition, um, which is, uh, has its advantages definitely for marketing. Um, if you win some banners, it, it increases your ability to market animals at higher prices. It grows your network of people that you, that you know. And it's extremely important for developing a passion in youth. Um, you know, as a youth, we all like to compete. And so getting involved in raising animals and competing as a youth is what developed a passion in me um, for, you know, being in animal agriculture. I think that's a very important going forward. Uh, it gives us that level of competition. The downside to exhibition is oftentimes outliers are the ones that win banners. And so we start selecting for things that are outliers. And I put this picture up off the banner sheet magazine um, just a few months ago. Um, everyone has their own opinions, but to me that animal is very an outlier for what I would, I would consistently think of uh, for that breed. Um, it's also very subjective to the eye of the judge. Um, and so they're not always gonna get placed the same every time. And often we have opinions about what is better uh, but rarely do we have really strong fact-based uh, matters on what this look gives us in quantitative measures on the other end. And so um, things have their, their advantages and disadvantages, and exhibition does as well. So as we think about once we've moving into more quantitative means of genetic selection, uh, centralized performing performance tests aren't really new. Um, we recently ended a test that had gone on for 70 years and that was the the sheep the ram centralized performance test that was held in in san angelo and so these performance tests are are good ways to do cross flock comparisons so we can bring animals from a number of different flocks put them in one location test how productive they are um, you know for for wool producing animals we can maximize fleece value uh, we can maximize rate of gain and there's not a lot of effort that's required by the consigner. So they don't need to keep a lot of records at home. They just raise an animal of a particular uh, season of birth, submit it in, and, and you know, the performance testing organization provides all the data. Uh, the negative to this is often it's in an artificial environment. The centralized RAM test is in a feedlot. And uh, many times the feedlot is unlimited feed and that doesn't really select animals for a hard environment such as uh, we have in kind of West Texas where the majority of sheep and goats are raised in the state. It gives us no indication of reproductive assessment, um, very limited on parasite assessment. We, we're starting to expand this a little bit. We're not gonna cover it today, but Jake's doing some research on uh, artificial inoculation and in a feedlot system, but we don't have our own data to that yet. Um, this is not, completely new technology, 
Uh, but if you want to follow up with that, you can follow up our Facebook page. We've been doing uh, live videos on that. Uh, we do host uh, an Angora performance test where it's in the pasture. So we do get some level of uh, fitness to the environment and parasite, uh, the ability to manage parasites in a, in a natural environment. But those things are, are pretty costly. Um, it costs us a lot to operate these tests with labor um, and the consigners have to pay that. And we're not getting at the biggest trait that maximizes flock productivity and that's reproduction. Um, you know, almost every time if a ewe raises twins, she's going to be more profitable than a ewe raises singles. And so that's why um, we, we've moved on to on-farm performance testing. So the, the Dorper breed is fairly new as we think about sheep breeds. And so there may not be as much reverence for the past as there is with other breeds, such as like the Rambouillet or some of our terminal sire breeds that are, that are much, much older uh, in the U.S. Uh, not that the Dorper is not a, an older established breed, but many times people really have a strong reverence for the past. But when we look at the curves of sheep numbers in the U.S. over the past, um, you know, 50, 60, 70 years, it's not very pretty. And so at some point in time, we got to recognize that what we're doing is not working and we need to try and adapt and evolve um, to things that, that may change the scenario. One thing that's always kind of bothered me is um, the loss of market share that we've seen in the U.S. And so in this graph, the green bars are, um, or, or the total bars from, uh, I guess is uh, thousands of tons of consumption of lamb in the United States. And the green part of that segment is US production and the yellow is imported production. So you can see from 1980 to 2019, we've lost over half of the market share to imported products. Um, you know, some will say that we didn't produce it and the imports had to come in and, and um, you know, take on that market share because we weren't producing it. Some others would argue that the imports were cheaper and so they stole market share and people went out of business because the prices weren't what they needed. But regardless, there's opportunity to grow and produce more product for a U.S. consumer as long as we can do it economically. And so uh, we've seen some major shifts uh, here, here in Texas. I'm, I'm not sure what the demographics are of everybody on this call, but here in San Angelo, uh, we've seen a major change over the last 10 years. This used to be a wool sheep dominated uh, part of the region or region of the United States. And now almost 10 to one uh, lambs that go through producers livestock auction in San Angelo are hair sheep. Uh, it's not quite 10 to 1, it's getting pretty close to that though. And so uh, we've seen a, a really big change and there's a lot of people interested in hair sheep due to their fitness to the environment, um, their growthiness, the way that those animals fit the current consumer trends and things like that. So um, with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over and let Jake talk to you um, as we look at innovation for the future. Sure. Um, thanks, Reed. So we were kind of just discussing this topic and, and kind of brainstorming how we wanted to set, set up the rest of this presentation earlier. And, and really, we kept going back to the fact that, you know, Dorpers, the reason why people are drawn to Dorpers, and if I asked, and if we asked, you know, each of you why you went into the Dorper business, you'd probably have a little bit different answer. But in a lot of ways, the strengths of the breed, their adaptability to the environment, you know, their fertility, reproduction, tolerance of parasites, the ability to stay in condition, all those things that are really important to commercial sheep production uh, are, are strengths of the breed. But that's a really slippery slope because if we just assume that all the members of the breed are that way and that gives us the liberty to select them for other things, that it, you know, eventually those strengths of the breed start to diminish. And so what we really find uh, beneficial about some of the technology that we're going to go through here in the next few slides is its ability to capture data about traits that are really economically important and it's specifically ep economically important to dorpers and, and those uh, types of breeds and so the the title of this uh, presentation is or you know the kind of the, the theme here is next generation breeding technology but this first one we're going to talk about in all honesty is, is fairly old 
uh, quantitative genetics. Um, National Sheep Improvement Program is uh, the program that offers this type of service to the sheep industry. It's, it's fairly old. It's been around uh, since the early 80s and maybe even potentially a little earlier than that. Um, but the adoption of this type of technology is really starting to gain some steam and, and some uh, uh, they're starting to get more members involved in within the last five to ten years and that's what makes it something that's really effective and profitable when we think going forward. So NSIP or, or National Sheep Improvement Program, what this allows us to do is to capture data about the genetic merit of our animals in the environment that we expect them to perform in. Uh, Reed talked about centralized performance testing earlier, and one of the drawbacks of that is that we were taking animals out of the environment that we were expecting them to excel at our farms or ranches or our home place, and we were putting them somewhere artificial, mainly in a, at a feedlot where they had unlimited nutrition, and what that caused is, yeah, we were able to see some differences in those animals, but when we brought them home, were they going to perform the same? Were they going to pass on the genetic merit that was still going to allow their lambs to excel uh, when those lambs didn't have access to the same level of nutrition that their sire did? And so that's one of, one of the things that's really a strength about using estimated breeding values in the National Sheep Improvement Program. It allows us to do on-farm performance evaluation. Let's see if I can figure out how to advance the slide here. We talked about the, the fitness to environment, adaptability of the environment, um, and, and the strength of being able to do that on-farm on on performance testing is really being a pro of this type of technology. Additionally, it allows us to capture and measure data for a whole wide range of, of traits, anywhere from lamb growth uh, to parasite resistance, fecal egg counts, uh, reproduction, number of lambs born, number of lambs weaned, um, there's some health type stuff that's associated with, with National Sheep Improvement Program data. And so it allows us to capture uh, economic, economically relevant traits uh, from a number of different aspects. And at all reality, it's fairly low in cost. We're only talking about a, a 3 to $4 a, a head uh, cost to do this type of, or to get this type of information. The drawback to it, though, is that it takes quite a bit of effort. Uh, and so really, this type of technology is certainly targeted for seed stock type of producers. Those of you that are generating breeding animals that can be sold to the commercial sector, uh, because there's going to be quite a bit of data that needs to be captured on animals, specifically all the animals in a contemporary group. And there's going to be some handling of that data that takes some time and some effort to learn. Um, so we're not going to certainly sit up here and say that everything about NSIP is really easy. You certainly require some effort to get in there and handle the data uh, appropriately and capture it, but it can tell you so much in the end. And so how this type of technology works is we kind of want to take a step back to probably uh, something that you learned back in, in high school. You know, phenotype, how an animal looks or things that we can measure, like a weaning weight or a fecal egg count, that is all a phenotype. And that's a result of an animal's genotype, its genetics, and the environment that it is reared in. And so how quantitative genetics works is it tries to limit that environmental effect. And so there's many things that fall under that environment umbrella. Uh, that could be from nutrition to location, time of year, uh, you know, pasture conditions, litter size of an animal is reared as a single or a twin or a triplet, uh, its own age in relation when you start to think about comparisons to uh, its other um, contemporaries, you know, how much older or less or younger is it than, than some of the others, also the age of the dam, those are all things that can affect an animal's performance but they fall into that environmental category. And so we're trying to limit or at least adjust for those types of things to make true comparisons of just the genotypes or the genetics. And so we do that by comparing animals in contemporary groups. Uh, so contemporary groups are animals that have all been reared or treated under similar management. And so that environmental effect starts to be limited and we can make those the comparisons. Go ahead, you can advance it.
And what comes out is estimated breeding values or, or EBVs. And you know, I've got a picture here from a, a ram that we're actually offering in a sale later on in, this month. And you can see the information there that's provided on the bottom. So uh, there's, a, there's a few things, date, date of birth, rear type, um, birth type, that kind of stuff. But there are the last, uh, let's see, seven columns on the right. Those are estimated breeding values. And what those are, are figures that estimate this animal's performance and the performance of his offspring versus the breed average. And so when we start to look at something like um, number lambs weaned as a percentage, this animal's offspring would be expected to have 4.6% greater number lambs weaned than the breed average. And so in this case, you can think of zero as the breed average. Uh, you know, as animals um, get enrolled in, type, in this type of technology and, and pedigrees advance, uh, those averages start to creep up above zero. But for all intents and purposes at this point, you can compare an animal's EBB against zero and whether it's good or bad for that specific trait. Now, another component of this is the accuracy. So in quantitative genetics, what's the, the beauty of it is it doesn't just utilize uh, an animal's own uh, phenotypic records and not the actual weaning, just the weaning weight of this ram or just his own fecal egg counts. What it does is it incorporates all of the information and data from relatives of this animal, whether that's sire, dam, half siblings, or progeny. And so when you start to accumulate all those records, the more accurate these EBVs get. And so when we build this database, uh, you know, quantitative database NSIP, what ends up coming out are thousands of records that affect a single EBV value and improve the accuracy. This is really a, a neat slide. So this is actually some information that was returned to us on a flock of sheep that we have here at the San Angelo Research Station that are enrolled in NSIP. And Reid actually put this together and, and so he, he might have, uh, he might wanna jump in here in a second. But on the top here, we've got five animals. And so that's represented by this uh, 16 digit code here. And those are, are five different U's. And then we've got EBVs, so birth weight, maternal weaning weight, weaning weight, post weaning weight, percent fat, percent height muscle depth, or excuse me, post weaning fat, um, yearling weight, number lambs wean, scrotal circumference, fecal leg count, and then a few indexes. And we'll go, we'll talk about indexes here in a second. But those are um, just some of the categories that uh, you're able to generate an estimated breeding value uh, on. But there's also some additional information here. So in this column right here, I wanna draw your attention to, this is progeny. And so these are actually used and they were born in 2011. So they actually entered into production for the first time in 2013. And since that time, up until 2020, this is the number of lambs that they have reared. And you can see that there's quite a bit of difference here. Um, you know, you look at this U here, obviously entered into production in 2013. So that gives her seven or eight lamb crops um, that she's had an opportunity to raise a lamb and she's raised nine lambs. Uh, so not bad, but so probably one that we would hope for a little bit more. But look at this you directly below her. She's raised 15 lambs over that same time period. Now, if you were to look at the daughters of those ewes on any given year, you might not be able to know that. Um, they, they would probably look very similar. However, you can see that there's quite a bit of advantage in at least the, this ewe for number of lambs born and, and raised. And so an estimated breeding value in this column, number of lambs weaned really reflects that. There's a negative uh, in this for this animal, which is not necessarily a good thing for this trait, and a positive 13 for this ewe. So there's quite a bit of a gap here in the number of lambs weaned that are expected between these two females. Now, that's, that's pretty straightforward. When you look on the bottom part of this slide, these are a little bit younger use. So they were born in 2014, they entered into production in, in 2016, and the number of progeny that they've had is a little bit closer. Um, you know, you've got nine, eight, and then six down in here. And so really this U is, is probably, when we think about performance, has performed um, not as ideal as, as the others here. 
And she does have a lower number of lambs weaned uh, figure that reflects that. She's still above breed average, and that is because of some records that have been accumulated on animals that are related to her. But again, this has allowed us to really um, differentiate these animals for this trait, even though the raw data or the phenotypic records isn't a whole lot different. Go ahead, Reed. Well, I was just going to make a comment that back on that first one, when we had a ewe that um, you know raised 15 lambs and eight lamb crops, um, you know that that only one year out of that eight did she not give birth to more than one lamb, whereas the other ewe, um, you know, one out of eight years gave birth to twins. And so a lot of people want to increase uh, reproductive rate by only selecting twins. Well, you could have caught a set of twins out of that one ewe that was pretty low um, and be misled in, into thinking that they're going to really advance your reproductive rate. Whereas the breeding value takes all those years into perspective, but it kind of gives you a, a very low um, prediction of that because we're only seeing a 17% difference in, in total lamb crop, when in reality, those ewes almost had a 200% difference in total number of lambs reared. Go ahead, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so this is some data that I thought was really interesting. Uh, so we're switching gears a little bit here to, to parasite fitness and, and parasite tolerance. So we had the opportunity uh, earlier this year to collect fecal egg counts on an outside collaborator's lamb crop, about 200 lambs. And we were able to do this twice at two different periods, once in April and once just last month here in July. And that's represented here on this graph. And so all the column on the, or the axis on the left, average fecal egg count by sire group. And so uh, through actually DNA, we were able to match up uh, the sire of each one of these lambs. So I sorted them by their sire. And you can see here, uh, the columns represent the average fecal egg count of that sire group. Now on the axis on the right is the number of lambs sired. And so that's the, the orange line here. Uh, so in this case, like ram three, he actually sired the most lambs out of all the rams, 80, actually just above 80. And so that's a great thing. You know, he's obviously, at least compared to these other bucks, fairly high libido. He got out, he bred the ewes, and that's something that um, is really a positive for him. But if you look at this uh, a little more closely, the progeny from that ram are actually some of the highest, if not the highest, for average fecal egg count at both the April collection and the July collection. Um, Ram 2 here, he actually was the highest, um, or at least his lambs were the highest in July. However, there was only uh, four of them, and so we can actually kind of exclude him from the data set. He didn't have that many uh, low sample size. So of the, of the rams that had a, a significant number of lambs, this Ram 3 actually probably had, his sire group had the highest average fecal leg count. Now look at Ram 4. You know, he had the second most lambs, uh, around 40 lambs, and they were actually significantly lower for fecal egg count average at both collections. If you compare just those yellow bars, um, you know, his, his sire group only averaged about 300 eggs per gram uh, versus, you know, say Ram 3, which was eight or 900. Same thing, same story in July. And so this type of technology allows us to identify these animals and the fact that they may potentially be superior for this trait. You know, I, I looked, and it's not included in this graph, but I looked at the weaning weights and the post weaning weights of all these lambs and broke that out by sire. And honestly, the lambs from Ram 4 don't necessarily stand out. Um, you know, they are kind of right in line with everybody else for size and, and weight. And so I think if you just walk down in the pen, and we're trying to pick which ones were the best, at least for parasite resistance, if you wouldn't know. But when you start to collect this type of information, it starts to become much more clear uh, which animals may be superior here. And so when we use quantitative genetics, this is just raw data, but when we use quantitative genetics, it compounds this type of information. It, you, it allows us to combine year after years of this type of data um, also, you know, again, sharing this information from 
um, both the sire, dam, half sibs, progeny, all that comes into one complete estimated breeding value um, that really allows us to make those type of comparisons. Hey, Jake, can you go back to that slide for one sec? I think this slide does a really good example of, of how to think about, when Jake says contemporary group, if you're not real familiar with this, it takes a group, you know, at a particular time and then creates an average. And so I think a lot of times people want to look at the actual value and they want to think, okay, well, I had a lamb and that, that lamb was less than a thousand eggs per gram. Well, that all depends on its, its parasite exposure. And so, you know, in this example, whenever we took those samples in April, you know, the average was right around 500 eggs per gram. And so to get a good parasite challenge, we have to have 500 eggs per gram or higher for that data to go in. And whenever we first took this, we thought, well, oh, that's really not doing a really good job of separating the difference on those that are going to be more susceptible to parasites. Because reality, we really don't see clinical symptoms until an animal gets above 2,000 eggs per gram. And there was very few animals in this group. But in reality, after we came back in July, um, when the average was over a thousand eggs per gram and a pretty good chunk of animals were above what we would call a treatment threshold, it was still predictive. You know, so the, the, the April samples, you know, were low, but the lowest April samples were again, the lowest in July. And so it was capturing that, that, that difference. And so it doesn't matter what the number is, it's just, was it above or below average? And so that's, that's a great example of, of, of that right there is don't get carried away in what the actual number is and it's the same way with weaning weight you know if we put a creek feeder out there we can increase our weaning weight by 10 or 15 pounds but it doesn't matter because everybody's going to have exposure to that creek feeder and so were they above or below the the average of the group and i think that's an important thing um, that lots of folks will look at this technology and think well somebody just feeds better than me so it doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't work for them they're gonna have better reading values than me that's not true the animals that perform the best in the environment that are above or below average are what gets positive or negative values for people for for ebvs i think that's a great point thanks Randy. okay so to kind of stick with this this parasite information um, we are privy to a, a breeding value when you get your report back percent fecal egg count and that's shown here on the right. And so what's actually shown here are the EBVs for six rams that have sired lambs in our flock here at, at the research station. And again, their IDs are over here on the left. Uh, their other breeding values can be shown here, uh, but I specifically want to show you this percent fecal egg count. And in this case, actually a negative number is better. And so you look at this and there's actually five bucks that are above zero. A um, couple of them are quite significantly above zero. Some are closer to that average. And then we've got one sire here that's a negative 54. And so in this case, this negative 54 is the most desired EBV on, um, at least in, for this trait. And this would be a, a ram that we're going to continue to breed, him or his sons, if we are going to try to promote and, and go after this parasite resist, resistance type trait. Now, if you look at some of these other EBVs, like this buck here, 2506, I mean, he has a, a pretty significant advantage for post weaning weight. Um, his 12.5 breeding value is, is very impressive. Same with the ram below him, 10.6. Uh, yearling weight is quite a bit higher than these other rams. But when you start to go over to these columns here on the, on the right, they're quite um, significantly above zero, 4% fecal egg count, and they're not as high for number of lambs weaned. And so again, kind of going back to this theme of if you go out there and you look at this ram or you look at progeny of this ram, they're going to be big. They're probably going to be pretty shiny when you think about um, just, you know, their condition and in the pen. But are those necessarily traits that we are trying to, you know, promote from, a, from an economic standpoint? Uh, I don't want to say that we want to select against growth, and I don't want to say that every time you have a big lamb um, that that's a bad choice to keep. That's certainly not where we're going with this. We're just saying and, and promoting that if you need to collect this data for these other traits that maybe aren't as visual, 
use this type of technology that allows us to make the comparisons for those traits. And sometimes that'll tell a different story. And in this case, it does. So another segment of genetic selection and, and tools um, that's a little bit different is molecular technology. And so again, something that's been around for quite a while, um, and it's probably something that you're all somewhat familiar with. Um, if you've been around sheep for uh, a period of time, you have um, heard about scrape resistance and the R and the, the Q alleles, that's molecular type of technology, but it can go much, much further beyond just, just scrapey susceptibility and, and resistance. Uh, so in, in molecular technology, what we're actually doing is we're looking at that individual animal's DNA, and we're looking at the specific genes, uh, gene variants and mutations that that animal has, and trying to make those comparisons back to certain traits, be that disease is susceptibility um, or production type of traits. And so uh, where we currently sit with molecular technology is it's very accurate for simple inheritance traits or traits that are controlled by one or a few or limited number of genes. Horn pulled, scrapey resistance, those types of things where there's um, just a, sim you know, a single gene or, or one or two genes that um, control that outcome there is a really a chance to improve the accuracy uh, of breeding values or uh, you know numbers that make uh, that estimate phenotypes if we use molecular types of um, technology and there's certainly an endless opportunity so the ultimate goal with this type of technology is to be able to make predictions about performance oriented traits growth fecal egg count uh, parasite resistance reproduction um, we just need those phenotypes and to further research uh, to better understand which mutations uh, are associated with those performance traits. So some of the cons of, of this type of technology as it currently sits, there is a significant cost with it. Uh, so when we, we're going to go through some of the chips and panels that are available, um, but you're looking at, you know, 10 to, to $50 an animal, depending on what you want to have done. And often this type of technology is really specific to a breed or a genetic base that's been tested. So again, the ultimate goal is to be able to have uh, molecular tools that allow us to make comparisons of animals across breed or across populations that just doesn't exist quite um, in, in the form that we were hoping to get just yet. So some genomic panels or, or molecular genetic panels that are available to the industry um, come in a number of different uh, forms and fashions. We have whole genome sequencing or SNP chips that are really high density. So um, you may have heard of a 50K chip or even a 660K chip. What that means is that we're looking at that animal's DNA at 50,000 or 660,000 um, different spots for SNPs, which are uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are markers for gene mutations or variants. Now that's getting a little heavy and really whole genome sequencing and these high density chips are more geared for research uh, type of, of um, projects. What's available and can be very useful to uh, commercial producers are some lower density panels. So again, you may have heard of Flock 54, which is fairly new. It's offered by Superior Farms out in California or Neogen, which is another a genomics company that uh, has technology in a number of different species. And what these lower density panels allow us to do are make parentage calls or, or no parentage, uh, and also provide information on some of those simple inherited traits uh, that we talked about a second ago. Horn pulled, scrapey resistance, OPP resistance, uh, spider lamb condition, rickets is another one. Uh, and again, the ultimate goal is eventually to compile enough information from a research as aspect to be able to make predictions for production types of traits. And that's been done in some other species. Probably the, the greatest example of this is in dairy. Um, so there's, there's been quite a bit of genomics work that's identified gene variants that are associated with increased milk production and, um, you know, the, the impact of genomics on the increase of, of milk production over the last 50 years is something like 200%. So it's really been a, a heavily applied and very useful technology in that species. It's just, you know, in sheep, um, we're maybe not quite there yet, 
uh, but that's certainly a, a direction that we're hoping to get to. And so eventually uh, we want to again follow maybe uh, the lead of some of these other species and combine both quantitative and molecular technology to get the most information. So if you're um, an Angus producer, quite commonly you can go out and, and look through a uh, sire catalog and, and see a, you know, a picture of a bull, but it's going to be uh, associated with a whole bunch of information down here. And so these are EPDs, which are certainly quantitative technology, but they've been enhanced with genomic information. So in cattle and beef cattle, uh, we are been able to make those uh, gene marker identifications associated with several traits and what's come out of that are enhanced EPDs, meaning we have an expected progeny difference or an estimated breeding value that's more accurate without needing all the progeny records and all the uh, relative records that are needed in a solely quantitative technology base alone. And so this table here on the right is actually something that's really cool. Uh, this is the progeny equivalent. So when you include genomic information for a trait like birth weight, that's the same as having the records of 23 progeny of that animal. And so let's, you know, right from the get-go, before a bull ever has any calves, if you are use genomic technology, again, you are, as you come out with a, a EPD that's as accurate as a bull that did have 23 calves and a record for birth weight um, just by using that DNA information. Again, something really cool and just to provide some perspective on, on where we hope to get to uh, research-wise and in the future. Thanks, Jake. All right, All right. well I'd love to get there to that point, but uh, we need to get the huge databases that the uh, Angus breed has before we can get the genomics to do that kind of prediction for us. But so I'm going to kind of tie a few things up here. Um, you know, we again put this presentation together for a variety of different breed associations. Um, but I would say we're at a crossroads or in many breeds cases, probably beyond a crossroad. I don't think the Dorper breed is beyond the crossroad yet. But uh, just to be real honest, many times registered sheep within a breed are extreme versions of unregistered animals that fit that same breed phenotype or profile. Um, you know, if you were to go to a, a Rambouillet, a national Rambouillet show, the size and scale of those sheep compared to what is a normal commercial fine wool type sheep in Texas are very, very different. And I just want to express some caution to the Dorper breeders as they move down that road is, is that extreme version what your commercial industry really wants? And is that what's going to make them profitable into the future? Because if you both move too far in an extreme fashion and your commercial breeders stop buying registered animals, uh, then the show ring is the only place that you have a market outlet for them. And that might be your only goal is to produce show animals. And I don't, you know, I'm not judging that at all. I'm just saying that our, our research and our goals is to try and produce animals that fit the commercial industry. And so, you know, we want to encourage you to look at this technology to where um, you have the kind of best of both worlds. But it's going to take a pretty big shift in, in the way we operate and where we prioritize um, the time, the labor, and the efforts that we put into registered sheep. Um, do we want to try and, and go out and produce a really highly productive commercial animal for the seed or a, a commercial oriented seed stock animal? Or do we want to continue to just produce animals that fit a show ring phenotype? Um, you know, and without a focus on performance, um, often, you know, these commercial producers are going to seek their genetics that's elsewhere. And so hopefully you've got a really good connection with both the showing world and the, the commercial world and are, are producing that. But I think this technology is only going to bolster that, uh, whether it's quantitative or quantitative and molecular to improve it, how we produce animals that are productive, they're fit for the environment, they're parasite resistant, and they're doing all of these things. Um, I would say that we are highly committed to, to, to this technology. I mean, I started in this job a little over five years ago, and that was one of my big goals 
as a, a sheep and goat specialist is to make the industry aware of these technologies. And so we've been talking about these at field days at our sheep and goat expo, which is coming up in a couple of weeks, right, Robert? Um, and, and we've been doing a lot of these things, but we don't just talk about them. We're putting these things into practice and we've gone out and got grants. That's one thing I failed to mention before, but, uh, Jake is partially funded by two different granting organizations, the National Sheep Industry Improvement Center and USDA Sustainable Ag Research and Education. And a big part of his focus is, is education and outreach on, uh, performance oriented genetic selection. And so not only do we do these seminars and field days, but we work with county agents and we work with breeders in our region to implement this technology and share that information with other people. Uh, we've hosted uh, train the trainer type programs. Uh, we've hosted ultrasound schools. That's one thing we haven't talked about so far is doing ultrasound for carcass merit, uh, but we've hosted those schools and we can do more of those in the future if we have enough interest in them. And then we're also committed to, to doing more research. Uh, one example of that is our parasite testing lab that we got up and running this summer. And so uh, one of the limitations, if you wanna do this technology to breed for parasite resistance is having a cost effective lab to run those samples for you. And so that's one thing that we're doing now is we have started up a lab for just for, it's not for diagnostics, uh, if the animals have worms or not, it's quantifying the parasite load in a lamb crop. So we've started that lab and uh, we're continuing to do quantitative and molecular research, uh, helping improve the EBVs that are predicted by collecting more data and, and expand. We've expanded EBVs for parasite resistance to some of the range breeds. And then Jake has also done a lot of his, uh, his work using that Flock 54 chip and how well does it function for the Dorper breed where they may not have uh, used as much Dorpers in the background when they uh, develop that test. And so that genomics chip is even getting better through the research that we're doing. Uh, we also have a, a Dorper resource flock. There's 150 head. They're a Dorper, white Dorper cross. Um, they, were, they were purchased over 10 years ago for a Dorper Rambouillet comparison study. And when our geneticists retired that had done that project, we morphed this flock of uh, sheep into uh, a resource flock where we can do this research, but we can also help the industry by connecting genetics. And so we will accept uh, loaner rams from people who want to get uh, more genetic linkages. Uh, across these different NSIP flocks. And so we'll use outside rams um, from a number of different breeders and put them in the same uh, contemporary group comparison, kind of like the stuff we've been showing before. And so um, not only we do, do we do that, but we do in-depth data collection, probably beyond what most uh, seed stock breeders can do. We, take, we don't take birth weight because they do lamb in the pasture. Uh, without any human intervention. Uh, we use a genetic uh, parentage marker to match up which lambs were raised by which ewes and sired by which rams. We do use multi-sire mating groups uh, to kind of capture that, that breed up rate from the rams. Uh, we get a weaning weight, a post weaning weight, probably two post weaning weights, a yearling weight. We get carcass data from loin eye depth, loin eye back fat, uh, multiple parasite resistant uh, checks throughout the year. And so we do all of this, keep all that data and put it in, you know, so that we can demonstrate uh, how to use this technology, but also um, help link in other breeders. So um, how do you take advantage of this opportunity? If you're a seed stock breeder listening to this and, and you know, we're, we've probably touched on too much today and gotten too big uh, at a 30,000 foot level, we haven't got into the specifics, but if you wanna get into the specifics, we'll be glad to try and help you move through that. But if you're a, a seed stock breeder and you want to get involved in this technology, I highly encourage you to sign up for NSIP today. Um, you know, it's a free first year to get in. All they require is a hundred dollar deposit on your database fees for that year. Uh, but when you do that, find a mentor. You know, if you're in Texas, the, the AgriLife Extension Service will help you. If you're outside uh, the state, we may be able to help you. But also NSIP has, um, has uh, breed reps and breed group reps. And so they can help you get started and, and get down the, load, down the road. I know uh, Paul Lewis was 
uh, saying that he was going to get on today. He's been using this technology for, for many decades and has offered to help people um, use the technology appropriately. And so I know there's people out there to help you do it. But don't just sign up because signing up a form and sending in 100 bucks is not going to make your sheep any better. You've got to commit to the technology. Um, and when I say commit to it, commit to a data collection plan. You know, you don't have to collect everything that we collect. You just need to find what's important to you and then kind of commit to that. Um, there is a cost each time you send data in. Uh, you only pay for an animal once and you only pay for a current lamb crop or last year's lamb crop when you're getting started. It's $3 per animal. Uh, you know, the flock fees are going to be between 100 and 400, depending on how, how big your flock is. So it's not a huge cost. Uh, be ready to, to do some data management, whether you keep that in Excel forms or you use the freeware that NSIP provides through Pedigree Master. But there's some data management and some sitting behind a computer screen and inputting data and taking time to learn how that process goes and you will get frustrated with it at times it's not super easy because it's complex stuff and you've got to get through it to, to figure it out and just kind of be resilient um, be patient many times people want to send their data in and then the first output they want to see you know negative 50 ebvs for fecal egg count and positive 20 ebvs for number of lambs weaned and you're just not going to see that right away it takes time uh, I generally say a, a generation interval, so five years before you see a big advancement in this technology, unless you start buying genetics from other breeders that have really put a lot of work in over the years and they have established EBVs for them. So you do want to connect to other seed stock breeders. As a breed association, how do you take on this opportunity? I think the first thing is acknowledge that it's an opportunity, that uh, breed associations have been very good at supporting the show ring, at supporting youth development, at supporting, you know, keeping registered animals registered and exhibited. Uh, but there's been not been a lot of support by U.S. breed associations for this type of quantitative technology. And so how do you do that? Um, you know, I made the mistake for, for a number of years just focusing on the animals and not focusing on the people. And so I think it's focused on people. Who are the ones that are going to be the early adopters to the technology and to jump on board with it? And how do you support them? Um, also recognize that youth are our next generation. You know, they're our next generation sheep breeders. And so how do we include some of this technology into the things that they do so that they're learning this um, as they grow up? They have more amiable minds than we do. We get kind of set in our thought process and it's harder to change, whereas youth come in. Um, I know I show the Raiders on here. I told Brad I was going to plug his kids on this, uh, this webinar. So I don't know if Brad got on or not. But, uh, and then support groups, um, creating groups of breeders or consortiums of breeders that really dive into the technology. I traveled to Australia in 2013 and was fortunate to inter interact with some consortium of really leading breeders over there. And they did some really advanced things to uh, put them on top um, for this using this technology and, and always being on top and if you all had ideas or wanted ideas on how to develop consortiums I'd be glad to share what I learned over there with you um, I would say you know provide support or uh, provide support for those seed stock breeders through education and data management you know Jake was talking about the Angus breed and all the things that they've done you know they do all this technology they hire the geneticists to do it and they have they invested a lot to get to that point the sheep industry gets the good advantage of having one program that offers it for all sheep breeds and we actually outsource all the data the ebv generation to australia and it's a pretty low cost for a breed association to get involved but there's still some education and data management support that that would really help the breeders move this along um, and then also provide support for commercial producers. That's one thing you find on, you know, Angus, Hereford, all these beef breed associations and the dairy ones, how they communicate to the commercial producers to use the technology um, that's made available to them. Uh, you know, Jake put this last kind of statement in here, uh, you know, to build a relationship with science and technology. And I think he stole a quote from Henry Zerbe from the Lamb Summit last fall. 
Uh, and Henry's, uh, you know, been involved in academia and runs sheep himself, and now with uh, Wendy's food group or supplier and, and a leading thinker. And he made this statement, you know, too often we ask ourselves, what's the cost to change? What's going to cost me to do something? And not thinking about what's it going to cost if we don't, you know, if we don't do this, where are we going to be in 10 years or 20 years? You know, will we be the, the most popular breed out there still, or will somebody else capture that from us because we didn't use the technology to stay on top the whole time. And so I think that's an important piece. So um, we're about five minutes away from an hour. I was hoping to get through this a little bit quicker. We got a little verbose uh, there, Jake, uh, you and I both, but uh, we've got some time to answer some questions here. I think Robert can open the floor up. Uh, I think there is a chat over here. Um, and in the chat it says, how much research has been conducted on the parasite resilience, depending on buck? Can you definitely state that bucks have a strong influence or does the you have influence? Um, Jake, this is your kind of wheelhouse on genetics and, and parasite work. You want to take a shot at that one? Uh, so Absolutely. Regardless of the trait, uh, the U is going to have an influence too. Uh, and, you know, quantitatively speaking, we think of genetics as being 50% from uh, the, the sire and 50% from the dam. And we know that that's actually not exactly true. Um, you know, those nice perfect round numbers don't always happen in inheritance of, of DNA and genetic merit. But more or less, we are getting proportionally some from the U and, and some from the RAM. And it's totally going to depend on what specific trait and specific gene variant um, that is being carried, whether the which phenotype is going to be expressed. Uh, res parasite resilience is an interesting um, trait. So it, as compared to parasite resistance, uh, parasite res resilience would be the ability of an animal to withstand a high parasite load. Uh, so in the case of Hamacus contortus, which is um, the internal parasite that we're probably most concerned with here in the United States, they're a blood feeder. And so they actually are going to consume uh, blood from that animal and red blood cell percentage is going to diminish, diminish in that animal. And that's actually what ends up being the clinical signs and, and problems uh, of, of that sheep is they are quite literally don't have the uh, ability to, to carry oxygen throughout their, their system. And so we measure things like pack cell volume, uh, which is a percentage of the blood uh, that is red blood cells. And we can also use something that's a little more simple called FAMACHA, which is uh, ability to measure anemia by looking at the eyelid. Um, and those are all ways to, to somewhat measure parasite resilience. But what's tricky and what can be problematic about having animals that are resili uh, very resilient is that they can still carry a high parasite load. And even though they may not be showing signs themselves and still be performing well, what they are doing is depositing a lot of eggs out on the pasture. And so through some, some various research and work that Reed and I and others have done, we know that a small percentage of the flock is actually carrying a high percentage of the worms that are out there. And those, you know, that 20, 25% of those animals may be depositing 75 to 80% of the eggs out on the pasture. And so if you have a really high parasite resilient animal, that animal actually still could be harming other members of your, your flock or herd just because they're depositing so many parasites out in the pasture. So it's a good thing in the sense that that animal is not affected, but you have to, it's kind of a slippery slope. You have to be really careful about selecting for something like that because you have to think of the greater flock management there. I think another important part of resistance at that age is, is the lambs are probably um, getting equal parts resistance from male and female. But when you test a lamb at weaning, which this is the Katahdin's, um, and this is the average Katahdin now, is a negative 33% weaning fecal egg count. When you measure them at weaning, the ewe's milk production and everything that she does to raise a lamb influences um, its fecal egg count, as well as genetics, as well as if it was a single twin or triplet. But once they're weaned, and we generally recommend after weaning to treat everybody in a group and then let them get exposed to parasites and then test them again in 90 days or so, um, that the heritability of the post weaning fecal egg count is much higher than the weaning fecal egg count because you remove more of those environmental factors 
that in, were influenced that weaning. And so the Katahdins have found that, um, and, and this is true, not the, the data suggests that as well, that the heritability is a lot higher when you get further away from weaning because you take that maternal influence away. Great question. Any other questions, comments? See more in the chat box. All right, Jake, any final thoughts? I think you must be. Nope, I think we're good. I think we're good. Uh, All right. Well, thanks everybody for y'all's participation today. If you got any follow up uh, questions or stuff, you can go back in. Oh, we've got a chat uh, coming in here. I had um, another one read that came in. It says, Is there a link with muscle mass to resilience? That's a, that's, uh, a complicated question, and, and I, that's not something that I want to speak out of uh, my area of expertise. You could probably make some links uh, depending on um, condition and muscle mass as, as places that um, you, know, you have higher glucose storage and, and you know, how does an animal respond to stresses, uh, of any number of stresses, including uh, a parasite challenge, um, you know, that might fall into that. But again, that's, that's, not, that's not something that I feel really comfortable speaking to the exact specifics on. Yeah, I'm kind of the same boat. I, I can't say that I know what the exact correlations, positive or negative are, but generally in my thought process as as an animal is taking feed and converting it into growth, maintenance, or fueling the immune system to fight off parasites, um, you know, the more you put in an animal to grow fast or put on a lot of muscle, uh, you may take away their ability to fuel the immune system. But that exact link, positive or negative, and to the degree, I can't answer that. All right, uh, we had another question, when and where are you selling the test rams? Uh, we, we did market some on the NSIP's uh, online sale uh, a few weeks ago, and we will be offering a few more on the Texas Sheep and Goat Expo's um, Texas Performance Sale. And so if you follow our Facebook page, that'll be put up there, or if you go to the Sheep and Goat Expo's page, I believe there will be a link to our, our online sale. It's through Integrity, uh, Integrity Online Sale. And so if you go to Integrity and then look up the Texas Performance Sheep and Goat Sale, it should be, should be able to find it there. We should have something posted within uh, the next day or two on our Facebook page that talks about the, the lots that are going to be available. Uh, good question. Does NSIP link data to Australian EBVs? And um, that is an advantage to the DORPER, uh, DORPERs within the United States, is the other breeds, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, run in their own American database, whereas the DORPERs um, in the U.S., if you go through NSIP or land plan, are actually run in the same database as um, as the Australian Dorpers are. And so they will definitely link together. And the RAM that we showed that had the most, um, or the most advantageous parasite resistance with the negative 50, um, he came from, or he was sired by an Australian RAM that had negative uh, fecal egg count breeding values. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, again, if you have more questions, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, good to chat with you today and, and uh, take care. We'll see you around.